Welcome back to another episode. As I said in my last video, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what I did over the summer and how I prepared for my fall classes. To give you a little background, I was fortunate. I know many people did not know exactly what format their fall classes would be in until very close to the end of the summer. So there was a lot of work done to prepare for multiple modes of delivery, uh, some of which might even have happened you know, simultaneously. So I know there, there's a lot of work being done by a lot of people uh, to get their fall classes ready to go. I found out in late April, 1st of May, that my microbiology course, which is a large lecture course, about 250 students each semester, that that course would be 100% online for the fall. So I knew quite early what my situation was going to be for that course. I have another set of courses that are lab courses that I'll, I'll talk about in, in other videos. But in this video, I want to focus on the microbiology course and what I did to prepare for my fall. So as I said, I knew very early on what my mode of delivery would be. So that, that gave me a, a, a good head start, at least. Unfortunately or fortunately, I was also scheduled to teach the same course in the summer. And I made a decision even earlier on that course that if I couldn't be, you know, normal, full, face-to-face -face course, that I needed to move that one online as well. So I had already been thinking about it a little bit, and then the decision was made that the fall courses would definitely be online. So I took that as an opportunity. I knew that if I could get the materials ready for summer, it would give me a chance to practice those. It was the, the courses in the second half of the summer, so it would start in early July. And if I could get the materials ready in time, I had the opportunity to sort of pilot my way through that summer with a smaller number, about 80 students, and then move into the fall with some of the kinks worked out, hopefully. So that was the plan. I was working with our local university uh, group that, that helps with online courses and, and uh, handles all the delivery and all the training and all of that. So I had that support network as well. And it, it also worked out fairly well that the deadlines to have everything ready for the fall mostly fell by mid to late summer anyway. So the materials that I was preparing for fall needed to be ready about, you know, by the time I needed most of them in the summer class. So that, that gave me at least a timeline to work with. And it gave me the ability to look at what I needed to have done when I had to have it done. And, and I could do that over, I had a, approximately two months of, of actual work on the course. By the time I finished my spring courses, got, you know, that was already a lot of work to be to working on. Um, I switched over almost immediately to planning for my summer and fall course. And I also have another head start. This is not my first online course. I taught my first fully online course in 2002. So way back when, things were quite different than the technology that was available, the, the ability to do all the things that I can do now. Uh, you know, those, those have changed a lot. But at least I knew a lot of the basics of an online course and, and had that earlier experience. So I came into this probably better prepared than most. When I prepared to start making decisions about the course, before you get, you know, before I get into the nitty gritty of exactly how things worked in the course, I, you know, you kind of have to take that 10,000 foot view of the course and think about, you know, what are my goals? What do I want to do? How do I want to do that? Um, and I'll also say I had another big advantage when I talk about the content goals because I'm, in microbiology, teach a, the, the general microbiology. It's a sophomore level course at my institution. This course is the standard microbiology for science majors. And the American Society for Microbiology has curriculum guidelines that give what a major's microbiology course should include as far as the, the overall learning uh, goals. And so 
right off the bat, I knew what I was going to be teaching for the most part. The, the questions are then, you know, how do you organize it? How do you, how do you work with, with the students and activities and, and all of those things? The, the other thing I've, I've also taught a blended course before. So I, I've, I taught a freshman biology blended uh, for several years from about 2005 to 2010. And, and so I, I learned a lot in that course of kind of how I organize activities uh, because that course would jump back and forth between online activities and face-to-face -face activities and active learning things that I was trying to do in the classroom. And so between that, I learned a lot about kind of thinking about how to organize the, the different activities I wanted to do. I've been teaching my microbiology course as a, as a active learning um, based course for six, seven, eight years. Um, and so in that course, I've, I've you know, done lots of in-class discussions and we used clickers a lot as a way to generate information uh, that we could discuss in class. Those things, you know, those things had to change. So I, even though I had activities and wanted to try to keep many of those, the, the online format wasn't going to allow me to do those the same way anymore. So I had to be thinking about that. So I, you know, I have, I have about a little less than two months for when the summer class started, uh, about six weeks from the time I started development till the first class module had to be ready to go. Um, and so I had to make a lot of decisions early in May about how I would organize all the materials and how I would organize the course structure and, and how, I'm, how am I going to build in these activities that I'm, I'm used to including in my course in an online format and, and try to keep the class you know, interesting and, and effective um, for my students. So that's really where I started. I started with that 10,000 foot view. You know, here's my course content goals. Um, how am I going to get to those? And how am I going to adapt things I've been doing that I felt were, were you know, based on, on good active learning techniques and um, seem to be working well in the, in the classroom for the past several years, how am I going to adapt those to an, an online setting? And, and how am I going to do kind of try to keep that feel of the course that I feel I give students, you know, in that large lecture room, um, trying to connect to students and, and, and create an atmosphere that's you know, conducive to them being involved in learning. So, so I have to start there kind of think about the structure of the course. And so that was my, my, my first, you know, kind of big decisions I had to make very early on, um, is what am I going to do to, to fit the course together and make it work? So to complicate things, the online materials that I was creating also need to be used by other faculty at my university. I'm not the only person that teaches microbiology. I was put in, in the position of being the person who would create online materials that, that faculty could use for this particular course. Other people were doing freshman biology and cell biology and genetics and all these other courses that, that needed the same uh, treatment to, to get it online for the fall for these, you know, the switch uh, to, to online, fully online for these large courses because there was no way to teach them in a physically distanced way on campus. And so I, I, took on the microbiology portion of that. So when I'm creating this material, I also have to think about the other faculty in my department that may use that material. And, and that's really where I had my first sort of difficulty of how to do this. Um, because one of the very first things that, that, that I said um, when I had some meetings with some of the other people involved is like, is, is I felt like instructor presence was an important component. They, the students in the class had to feel like I was there teaching them, helping them, communicating with them. And I know there's lots of different ways that you can do that. For me personally, um, I have... I don't think I'm the best at large group discussion management in a class like that. Um, I do have discussions, but I don't think that there's a lot of, in my particular course and my particular style, that I'm, I'm fairly good at doing that in person, but I don't think I'm very good at doing that on, on, 
on a discussion board in a asynchronous way. Uh, and that is another important point about this course is um, I did decide early on it had to be asynchronous. I was not going to be doing live Zoom meetings at you know 10 o'clock on Mondays or whatever you know, the schedule would have been. Uh, so, so all of those things going in, I had to think about you know, how am I going to have instructor presence where the students feel more you know, connected to me as their instructor, um, but in a way that other faculty can also use this material. And so that right off the bat was, was a big challenge for me. Um, I decided for the instructor presence side of it that I would video some of the material um, for each module, but to balance that out, all the material is, is essentially anything I videoed is also available as a text-based form. So, so everything, and I'm not just talking about just a transcript. Um, I'm talking about actually a, a page in the course uh, delivery you know, system that that covers the same material in essentially the same way, but in a text-based format versus me delivering it as as more of an online lecture with you know the slides and things that I'm talking about. So, so I decided early on that I would do videos and include those because I felt that the the students who wanted that would have, you know, would, would feel that as a better delivery method because it was more familiar to them. Um, but that also gave the ability of the other faculty who would be using my materials to not use the videos if they choose. So the material is available another way. They could replace that video with their own. Um, I did create transcripts, of course, for all of those as part of the captioning. So they had an opportunity they could record the same video if they wanted using almost the same information based on those transcripts if, if they had the time or, or the ability to do that. So that that was that was a big decision for me on how to increase you know include that instructor presence um, in that particular way. Um, I'll also you know how I communicate with them and all that throughout the semester will be another part of that. But I thought the having a face and a name together um, with the you know the voice sometimes that that just helps make those connections a little easier i felt so so early on that was a decision i made i'm i'm going to have to include these videos so i'm going to have to plan and 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 do videos as part of that so one of uh, one of my early purchases in the spring that i could talk about you know later if we want to talk technology in another in, a, in another um video later um i did buy a a little mini um teleprompter screen that uses my cell phone to create the teleprompter um, attached to the front of my camera. So when I'm doing these lectures, I can actually create the entire script of what I want to do. And then I can read, you know, be having that running while I'm doing the slides and trying to lecture capture and things like that. So it just, it makes it a little more likely that I'm going to remember to say all the correct things things and and what I want to cover and not miss things. So so that actually turned out to be a, an effective thing that helped as well when I was creating these videos. It, it also smoothed the process of getting the videos captioned because I already had the text. So those were those were some of the technical things that that happened while I was making that. Um, so so I've you know I've made this decision that I'm going to be asynchronous. I've made this decision that I'm going to include videos, but I also am going to make sure that nothing you know, 99% of what's in the videos is also found else, elsewhere in a text uh, and, and, you know, graphical format in the, in the modules. So a student could go through the entire course and, and probably not watch most of the videos and still have all the information if they would rather read it. Um, that's their choice. I, I personally think that if they're going through the course, they should be reading it and watching the video and both together are probably going to give them... Um, you know, just a, a, a more opportunity to work with that material. But that's that's the way it's set up. They can do it either way, and so or they can do both. And and so I've got those two decisions made. You know, very very early. Another major decision for me was I needed to take the syllabus that I'd been using, which was we all the the microbiology um, instructors here have taught very very similar material. But we all, you know, do them in a different order. We, we've, we've actually been using different textbooks, which was another issue with the uh, sharing of the videos and the, and the course materials. And so I needed to go through that, all that material and look at it from the standpoint of what, you know, what order does everything, what order do most of the faculty use and 
and um, try to fit to that order so we had a common uh, syllabus order so that there wasn't a lot of work that had to be done reorganizing the course of the material. So so I went through and, and went through the syllabi of all the other instructors who might be using the online course. I took my information, merged it with their information, I ended up reorganizing. I, I covered essentially the same things, but I dropped a couple of things that are a little esoteric that I enjoyed um, talking about. Reimagined one of the things that I did, um, and I can, uh, I don't want to get into specific, you know, specific modules at this point, but I, I took something that I enjoyed doing that I usually did near the end of the course and found that I could actually merge that with something that's very early in the course and, and create a more interesting way of doing some very introductory material. And so I did that. And, and so in, in the end, um, the syllabus that I, that I teach probably covers 90% of the same material that I've always taught in this course. A little bit of extra stuff that, that I tended to not do that some of the other instructors tended to do and restructured a lot of it. So I ended up moving a lot of things around um, to actually follow the textbooks a little bit more closely, which I didn't always do, um, and also those other syllabi so that we would all be a, you know, a little more comfortable in the order of things. And, and so at that point, now I knew what material I'm going to cover in what order. That was, you know, that was a big step because it wasn't just a decision for me. I also needed to kind of get a little bit of input from those other instructors and, and make sure that, that that made sense to them. I use uh, an open educational resource textbook, the OpenStax textbook. Um, they do not. But they the textbooks basically cover the same topics, just not always in exactly the same order. So they can change out the, the, the chapter numbers and it'll, and it'll be fine. Uh, the material that the introductory reading for the material, either textbook would have, would have worked fine. I've used the same textbook they used in the past, but now I'm used to the, the um, open resource course, uh, open resource uh, textbook. And, and so, so that all those decisions had been made. Um, I needed to also think about other course structure things now. The, the the next thing that I think was my my big um, kind of I had to make decisions on before I could move anything forward was how many modules how many modules per test how does that fit across the semester try to keep things even how does it make logical sense to keep certain topics together you know for a test um, and I had always done three regular tests and a comprehensive final. Some of the other instructors do that. Some did one, one did four tests and a comprehensive final, but it was a comprehensive final is optional. I mean, there's just lots of different variations for ways to do it. So for this online course, I decided the simplest and most you know effective way to probably do it was four tests, four regular tests, no comprehensive final, because that created some other logistical issues. And so I, I decided to do that. And as it worked out, as I looked at modules, I merged a few topics, did a little massaging to, to all the different topics I was looking at, and I came up with 24 modules. And so I could do six modules and then a test, and then another six modules and a test. And I could space those relatively evenly across the semester. And, and now I personally like regularity. I like students to know when things are going to happen in a regular manner. I think, you know, knowing that there's six modules and a test is a nice package. They can, they can keep up and follow that very easily. And it's not going to create any unnecessary stress on them trying to figure out what I'm trying to do or which modules are on which test. Um, the other thing that I thought was, was going to be helpful by doing it that way is now that I had the six modules set for each test, I wanted to give students more flexibility in how they did the material. Um, that's another issue, especially with so much happening and everybody and stressors and all that. What I wanted to do is take the material and with the six modules, some of those modules are kind of what I would call a double module because what I started with was sort of one class period, which was a 50 minute class period in a regular semester. One class period started out sort of as one module. Um, but some topics took me two class periods to cover or two very similar topics that, you know, could be merged into a to, to, to happened over two or more class periods. So what I did is I took that same idea 
And if I, if I covered a topic in one class period, then I set that as a single module. And if I covered a topic in two periods or merged two topics together that would, would have been in two periods, I kind of thought of that as a double module. And so when I look at how much time I give students to do it for the fall semester, basically I give students about 48 hours to do a single module and I give them about 96 hours to do a double module. So there's not exactly evenly spaced, but by the time we get through a, 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 a section of the course, we've covered about the same amount of what would have been in face-to-face -face lecture time. And so that, that worked out pretty evenly as well for me. And so that was just my way of organizing it and keeping things straight and kind of organize it for the students. But the other thing that I wanted to do with that is I took the, 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 the flexibility of an asynchronous class and, and I set module due dates based on what I just said. If, if I give them a module, on, and I try to set it up on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday type schedule, because that's the way course was taught before. Uh, so it just gave, so again, another set of regularity to the students. And if I assign a module on Monday, they it's going to be due on Wednesday. I also made a decision that things are due at noon, not midnight, and that there's other lots of other reasons for that. Um, but I'm very, very clear with students very, very early on that it's going to be a noon deadline. Uh, they still get the 48 hours. They can, and, and I won't go into more on that, but, but I, I chose noon as a deadline because I kind of felt one reason was if everything's due at midnight, students have too many things due at midnight. So I thought having a, a different time, as long as they knew when it was and it was regular, might actually be a good thing. So I went with noon, and there were several other reasons into that decision that helped with the scheduling of things. So, but the other thing I did with that is even though things are due at noon, all the modules for a section actually technically open on the same day, but they each require the, pri the previous mod module in order to open them. So if you're going to do module one, you can't see module two until you finish everything that was due in module one. But as soon as it's due, as, or as soon as it's turned in, you can see module two. So... Students can always work ahead within a section. So up to the, the, first, the those six modules and the test, anything before that test can be done early. Um, now, I'm not expecting students to do things early, but it gives them flexibility. You know, if, if a student is going to be, you know, working extra shifts on a particular weekend, they could choose to, to take their days off and get two or three modules done rather than have to wait for me to open that module on Friday that now they don't have time to do on the weekend. So, so I put in that flexibility that's, a, it's, a, it does, it requires planning on the student's part. So I'm, I'm not expecting everybody to do things early, but they have the ability to do things early. So, so that part of the flexibility I built in. And, and so, you know, I, I think that that gets around a lot of the, the scheduling problems many of our students may have, is if they know they have something coming up, they have the ability to work around that more easily without requiring input from me or permission from me or anything like that. The other thing I did on flexibility is I made a decision that they can turn in thing, they can turn in any module work, except for a few exceptions because there's a group project and some things where there's no way to turn that in late because then you're turning it, you're forcing other people to be late. Um, except for mostly for the group things, anything that's individual, which is the majority of the things that they turn in, um, those items, quizzes, assignments, whatever, can be turned in late, basically up to 48 hours late. Now, there's a penalty, and I chose the, the course management system we have has an ability to automatically put in a late penalty based on the due date, and I chose a 2% per hour penalty. So if somebody is a few hours late, the penalty is very relatively minor. If they're two days late, then they basically lost all of the points. You know, by the time they're at 50 hours, they've lost 100% of the points. But again, that does give more flexibility to the student who's you know unable to get something done right at, at that time. They can take a small penalty and these are lots of small assignments across the semester. A few small penalties probably won't affect their overall grade. So those, that's those structural things. It's asynchronous, but it's flexible. I've tried to include the video as a way of making it one way of inclu including more instructor presence. Um, I, you know, 
I think communication, I try to communicate back quickly. I try to communicate a number of things just from general announcements and things um, early in the semester, reminding people about deadlines early and, and things like that, at least at the beginning of the semester while they're, they're getting their feet, you know, settled and how to, how this course works. Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for at least those attempts towards some sort of instructor presence, which, um, I know, you know, large 250 person kind of class is a little bit harder to do, at least from, I have a little more trouble doing that with things like discussions, which I, I, I find a little more awkward for that. Um, other people may do that really well and I'd love to learn from you. Um, I, I can always learn more, right? So, so I think those are, those are a lot of the structural features. Um, you know, we can talk more about like, how did I deal with assessments and and I definitely want to go back and talk some more about that um, especially in the context I think there's always a lot of concern about you know can students cheat this sort of thing um, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about that in one of the other videos um, because I think that is an important thing to to think about how to make it so that the good students who aren't cheating are not penalized by your attempts to keep other people from cheating. That's one of my other issues that I have with some of the things that we do um, to prevent cheating. So, so we'll talk about that in, a, in, a, in another video. But I think that's trying to give you just an overview of the decisions that I had to make early on in how this course was going to be structured. And, and then once I've made those decisions, then I could get into more specifics about, you know, how is a module structured? And, and I think that would be a, Another one, and maybe I can even, um, um, we can talk about some of the specifics of how, what are some of the common elements and things like that that I did to make the module structure across the course similar for students each time. So I think that's, that's a good overview to start. Um, and we'll continue with some of the decisions and things that I made and how I made my course. And again, one of the reasons I want to do this is hopefully that will at least create some ideas for you and help you as you're making your own courses and uh, your own decisions in this manner. So thank you again for watching and I will see you soon.